Well, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Um, I think very often when people turn 50, uh, they start suffering from a severe bout of uh, midlife crisis. But how about the EU? Uh, there was a lot of uh, critical comments a few years ago, even here in Davos, about the status of Europe and, and not achieving certain goals. I have to say that uh, things have changed dramatically. Europe seems to be stronger as ever. The monetary policy, the European Central Bank has had a very strong uh, stance uh, during the financial crisis so far. Enlargement has clearly helped. And so it will be interesting to hear from our panelists what their European dream is. And let me start with a quote from Timothy Garden Ash, written in 2004. And I quote, so the old Atlantic-centered West, which has been shaping the world since about 1500, probably has no more than 20 years left in which it will still be the main world shaper. That's another reason why it's so stupid for Europeans and Americans to waste any more time squabbling with each other. In a longer historical perspective, this may be our last chance to set the agenda of world politics. So let me start with Mr. Pöttering, the President of the European Parliament, in asking him what could be the European contribution to setting the global agenda. Mr. Pöttering, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I think the most important thing is that we as Europeans in the European Union know that we are not just a political or an economic organization. If we want to play a role in the world, we have to know that the European Union is based on values. And if you allow me to say that I am one of six members of the European Parliament since the very first election to the European Parliament in 1979, and if somebody would have told me in 1979 that in the year 2008 and even before, three nations which were occupied by the Soviet Union, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, that the countries of the Warsaw Pact, the military organization of communism, Poland, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary and Slovenia as part of the former Yugoslavia and now with all problems Bulgaria and Romania would be part of the European Union of our Union of Values then my answer would have been in 1979 this is a vision this is a dream this is a great hope and those countries are now members of the European Union and they share with us our principles our values and that means the dignity of the human being, human rights, democracy, the legal order, solidarity, subsidiarity, social market policy. And so Europe has developed in a way which I think is fantastic. And if you allow me to add, I took part yesterday in a meeting in my own region in the north of Germany where we celebrated 50 years of what we call in our German language Euregio, a European region between the Netherlands and the western part of Lower Saxony and of Westphalia. And people are cooperating over the borders and we are friendly to each other now. And if this is a basis of our future development in the European Union, our values, then I'm deeply convinced we will play our role not only on the European continent, and in the world as well. The values are the basis of everything. Thank you. The Prime Minister of a country which has rejected uh, the EU constitution some years ago, and by the way, thereby almost plunging uh, the EU into a deep crisis. What is your view on that? And maybe you could also add a little bit the uh, flavor from your country, how things have developed in parallel to the overall sentiment in Europe, if this is the case. Mr. Balkanende. Thank you. Indeed, you're right. Um, we had a referendum on the Constitution, and it led to a no. Uh, but I want to clarify that no was not a no against Europe. 
We had discussions about the super state, about bureaucracy, about the speed of all the developments. But the most important thing was that people had the impression that if you talk about a constitution, is that something that belongs to us or is it something far away? And then I think it has been very wise to take time for reflection. And now we are talking in terms of a reform treaty, as we had in the past, like the treaties of Nice, of Amsterdam, and Maastricht. So I think that discussion is over. I'm very happy that we could find a solution. And now we can speak about the content, because I really believe that our future is in Europe. And indeed, things are changing from time to time. I remember the discussions in the 80s, and we talked about eurosclerosis. Then we talked about Europe 1992, and then it was euphoria. And afterwards, we talked about China and India. But today, I think there is a big challenge for Europe. And at this moment, we are all talking about the financial crisis, the financial situation in the United States and how it might affect European economies. But let's look at what Europe is all about. We have a stable currency, the euro. And I think it's very important, also for economic reasons. We have an independent European Central Bank, and I'm very happy with that independent status. We have strong economies. We are busy with reforms. We have the Lisbon strategy talking about innovation. We have liberalized markets. We have a huge market. And I think that the way we are changing things in Europe is the best answer to all those difficulties. And then Hans Gert, I agree with you, Hans Gert, you know that. Europe is about values. And then the question is, what can Europe contribute to the well-being worldwide? And if you talk about issues around the Millennium Development Goals and development cooperation, if you talk about climate change, or if you talk about trade, the WTO, I think Europe plays a very important position. We have sophisticated organizations. So after the no, I say our future is in Europe. And I can imagine the argument we have 20 years. I must say I'm not sure whether that will be the situation or not. But there is really a challenge for Europe to work on the values, to work on the future of our continent, and I think we have a lot of possibilities. So I'm much more positive now than maybe some years ago. And when uh, you were visiting this um, uh, World Economic Forum, there has been a time that Europe was being bashed. And at this moment, what are people saying? The European economy is our strong. You're taking up your responsibilities as far as, as far as climate change is concerned. And I think that's the right way. We have to take up our responsibilities, and I think we can have a great future. But you have to work and fight for it every day. Thank you. Prime Minister Asperson, uh, two things. One is uh, also a little bit to hear your European uh, dream, of course. But secondly, I think some critics would say that uh, Denmark has followed somewhat the cherry-picking uh, strategy with regard to the EU's various economic and political projects, reflected, among others, by several... Uh, opt-outs, including the common currency euro. What factors do you feel would facilitate, or maybe it has happened in the meantime, a more pro-European attitude in Denmark, and at the end, maybe the adoption of the euro as well? Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, actually, uh, there is a strong pro-European attitude uh, in, in my country. According to to opinion polls, both national polls, euro polls, uh, the, Danish, um, the Danish people is actually very positive uh, concerning a strengthened uh, European uh, cooperation. But you're quite right that uh, some years ago, actually 14 years ago, uh, we, we got some uh, opt-outs uh, because the Danish electorate rejected the Maastricht Treaty in 1992. Um, but many things have changed in Europe uh, during that period of time. And this is the reason why uh, my government has now announced uh, that uh, we are going to put uh, the Danish opt-out to a referendum uh, during this new parliamentary term. As you know, we had the uh, elections in, in November. And after the re-election of the government, we have announced our intention uh, to get rid uh, of the Danish opt-outs. Uh, I uh, want Denmark to, to be at the very heart uh, of European uh, cooperation. I think the future of Europe, the future of, of Denmark, lies within the framework uh, of a strong EU uh, cooperation. 
Um, so this is the reason why I want Denmark to become a really fully-fledged member of the European Union. And uh, I think uh, after a very long process of continuous amendments of the treaty framework, uh, we should now focus uh, on giving the European Union a much stronger role at the international uh, scene. Uh, I would very much like to change um, uh, the European Union from uh, a regional player to a global player. I think time has come to go global. And uh, I would point to three, um, three important elements in such a strategy. First, trade policies. Um, I want an open Europe, uh, a free trade Europe, a Europe that uh, addresses the challenges of, of globalization positively and proactively. Uh, I think um, uh, the right approach to the challenges of globalization is to, to uh, improve our own competitiveness uh, through free trade and investment uh, in uh, research, development, uh, innovation, those factors that generate uh, stronger competitiveness uh, in a modern uh, world. So that would be my first point in going global. Uh, a free trade uh, approach. Secondly, climate change. I want a green Europe. I want Europe to take leadership uh, in the fight against uh, climate change. Um, uh, we are approaching uh, a UN climate conference uh, in uh, 2009, which actually will take place uh, in Copenhagen, uh, we aim at reaching an ag agreement uh, on a new global climate deal to replace the Kyoto uh, Protocol when it expires uh, in uh, 2012. We want a comprehensive uh, climate agreement taking on board all major emitters of uh, greenhouse uh, gases. Um, and I think we should uh, also in this respect uh, choose a proactive uh, approach uh, of course, we should set uh, binding targets for a reduction of uh, greenhouse uh, gas uh, emissions. But at the same time, uh, we should uh, promote uh, new eco-friendly technologies. Uh, we should be in the lead of promoting uh, what I would call uh, a new industrial uh, revolution, uh, aiming at creating a low-carbon society. And I think uh, the European Union should demonstrate global leadership in that respect. That's my second point. And uh, thirdly, international security. Uh, I want a committed uh, Europe. Uh, a Europe committed to promoting um, freedom, democracy, uh, human rights, peace, prosperity, uh, security. I want a strong commitment uh, on development assistance uh, to Africa. Um, civil reconstruction uh, in, uh, in Afghanistan, um, crisis management uh, in, uh, in Kosovo, um, concerted action with other partners in promoting peace and stability in the Middle East, just to mention some international security challenges. And I think the European Union should take on much more responsibility globally uh, in these respects. So that's what I want. Uh, an open Europe, a green Europe, a committed Europe, uh, that's what I uh, think uh, it is about to go global. Thank you. Thank you very much. Purpose, the European purpose, from a French view, or how could we convert or develop la grande nation to a grand Europe? <laughs> 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 I knew, jo Joe, you were going to be provocative. <laughs> you don't let me down. Um, I'd like to say that I'm extremely upbeat about Europe, actually. And uh, I'd like to just mention a couple of things. Remember this story about fog on the channel, continent isolated? That was a weather report from the UK. 
Well, look at it the way it is now. UK, the UK is part of Europe, and France in reforming its labour market, in changing the intermediaries that operate as unemployment agencies, is inspired by two countries, the UK and Denmark. Flex security, job centres. Remember comments about the old continent being Europe? I contend that being 50 is okay, Joe. <laughs> and being 50 is actually young compared with other federation of states which are celebrating four times as much as 50. So I think Europe is a very young animal and a very resilient one as well. And remember those comments about the old states of Europe, the old Europe versus young Europe? Well, you, some of you have attended many more meetings than I have, but certainly over the last two and a half years, having attended quite a few trade ministers meetings or ECOFIN meetings, I can assure you that the young European states and the old European states are certainly looking at the world with the same eyes and with the same view and proof of that is the real impetus that some of those younger European states have to join the euro and be part of that monetary uh, community. One more reason to be upbeat is clearly the fact that in 2007, thanks to the very strong leadership of Germany, followed by strong leadership of Portugal, we were able to adopt a new treaty which will be going under ratification uh, in the months to come. So for all those reasons, uh, I think we, have, we should be very upbeat about Europe. And the fact that so many countries want to be part of a game uh, with Europe is a clear indication that there must be something wrong, sorry, something right, based on that set of values that you were referring to but which also leads us to having this open free market with movement of goods and people, um, including Polish plumbers coming to France. Uh, that's okay. We need, uh, we need them, absolutely. They need them now back at home because so many of them have traveled. Um, but, but clearly this is, this is going well. And I would like to just propose two areas where I believe that uh, Europe uh, can be very global in its approach and can be a source of proposals. And it might surprise some of you if I say our proposals concerning the financial markets are actually sound, solid, and worth a review by others. Um, I don't know if you agree with me, Joe, and you would be obviously uh, ideally placed to comment on that. But some of the proposals that we have agreed should be discussed at the FSF um, level and at the IMF level uh, are really worth consideration and possibly adoption at a much broader level. Uh, they include, and they have included for a few months now, um, improved transparency on structured uh, financial instruments, uh, better disclosure by financial institutions, um, certainly more and better regulations at the supervisor level of uh, banks and uh, clearly a better governance, all in all, including on rating agencies. All the pr those proposals were discussed at, at European level and are forming a set of proposals not yet finalized and completed and on which everybody has uh, common views, but certainly where we are evolving towards a set of common, not values, but certainly principles, uh, which will be conducive to better and reinforced confidence in the markets. That's one example where clearly we are a source of propositions. A second area is, and it will come as a surprise, but I think it's, it's really worth consideration, is the common agricultural policy. Now, step back for a second. Remember two, three years ago, Europe came under heavy criticism from the United States, from various other countries, when it came to trade. And even internally, a wonderful Danish member of the Commission uh, was being... Um, disputed in the way she wanted to reform things. Well, certainly the way in which we look at agriculture, agricultural products, processed foods, and all the rest of it, 
is becoming extremely interesting in the light of rarefied resources and the way in which we believe that keeping agricultural land active and live is not without a connection with the high demand that is currently placed on those uh, resources. So without boosting about our common agricultural policy, but certainly with a view to reforming it and making sound proposals that can operate vis-a-vis -vis our partners elsewhere in the world, certainly on both the financial fronts and the agricultural fronts, I think Europe has a lot to offer, actually. Thank you very much. Last but certainly not least, uh, Mr. Babakan, the Turkish uh, purpose of uh, the EU, and you have also been the negotiator in the accession uh, discussions. Could you elaborate a little bit on what you expect from the EU and how important it is, uh, the membership uh, from a Turkish point of view? Well, our uh, view of European Union overall is an entity which is based on a set of values, set of aspirations, and these are commonly shared values, ideals, and aspirations. Especially after the Second World War, where many difficulties were uh, there between even the founding member states, the countries could find commonalities to join around, to work together to cooperate. It started with a, maybe a simple uh, collaboration about steel and coal, and now uh, it has become an entity of 27 member states. We have always seen also the European Union as an important peace project. Probably it was the most important peace project of the 20th century. Just stopping fighting on differences and joining around commonalities. Now, as the 21st century has already started, we are almost a decade into it, the EU is now becoming, especially for the last several years, more and more inward looking. Okay, there are issues with some countries. There is probably growth which is less than that would be, uh, that would be liked to be seen. There are some social integration problems social security issues in many, many countries. But in our view, this is going to be over. The EU will have its self-confidence back. Because what makes up the European <coughs> Union are strong bases to continue. The EU is a strong entity. There has to be just more realization of these strengths and more utilization of these strengths, I should say. And coming to the question of uh, the, the Turkish accession process, this is a process which started at the end of 2004. And when it started, it was cheered up all around the world. It was a global event in a way. Not only it was a big news for the European countries, not only it was a big event for Turkey, but anywhere from North Africa to Southeast Asia, it was a welcomed event. Especially after what happened 9-11, and especially after all the rhetoric about clash of civilizations, in a way, Turkish accession process provided an important source of oxygen so that uh, differences are there, but they can be worked on, and tolerance, and coexistence, and maybe multiculturalism should be the main theme. And the starting of the accession process of Turkey gave very right signals at the very right moment. And now we are in an enormous reform process. We have been doing political reforms, economic reforms, social reforms, and the country is changing very fast. And the process itself is also providing a very valuable uh, communication window or communication door. There's a lot of in interaction going on, a lot of interaction for people to know each other better. Now, Turkey is a main agenda item for every single EU member state. We have now student exchange programs. We have a lot of uh, NGO to NGO programs. Interaction is uh, there, and we see a lot of value in this. If the European Union wants to be a truly global power, it has to be also an inclusive entity. 
not an exclusive club of any certain ethnicity, religion, or a cultural uh, aspect, but it has to be a truly uh, global entity. And how this is going to happen is concentrating on the commonly shared things. And these are about democracy, fundamental rights, freedoms, rule of law, highlighting individuals rather than the state. And all these are now being more and more shared by Turkey, a country which has a majorly Muslim population and a country also where democracy, Islam and secularism can coexist and working together better and better as we go along. We believe that with Turkey in, the EU will be a more representative voice. With Turkey in, the EU will be a truly global actor. Right now, Turkey is very active in the Middle East, in North Africa, in Central Asia. Turkey is becoming more and more perceived as an energy hub to provide alternative energy routes to the European Union, which the Union, I believe, badly needs. And there are, there are so many things complementing each other rather than things which uh, are probably opposing or uh, diverting from, from each other. Of course, this is a process, a process which will probably take uh, a long time. It will be a difficult process. Turkey is not going to be just a 28th, 29th member in the Union. With Turkey in, the EU will be probably slightly different entity. Turkey is going to add a lot of new aspects to the European Union. And what's important for now, right now, is being in the process and continuing the process. And as long as things are on track and moving forward, this is a win-win process. Because Turkey continuously upgrades its system, upgrades its uh, norms, standards, deepens its democracy, and the EU wins because a country like Turkey is becoming more and more integrated with the EU structures. There is nothing to lose but a lot to gain by just simply continuing the process itself. Regardless of when the membership will happen, the process itself has a lot of value and it does have regional and global consequences. A lot of inspiration is happening. Countries in the region are looking at our reforms. They are getting the very right messages when they see Turkey going through this enormous transformation process. And in a way, Turkey is indirectly providing a safer and more secure environment or a neighborhood for the future of the European Union. Thank you. I think that was the nice part of the discussion. Uh, we talk about dreams, about concepts, uh, what we would like to achieve. But let's talk a little bit about reality. Uh, we still have... Uh, <laughs> Christine, there are certain products, I don't want to mention them now, because everybody probably knows what I'm talking about, which we still consider as a national treasure. Uh, and uh, they are energy companies which we would defend how could we achieve a more pan-European thinking, not only from a political point of view, but at the end also from a people's point of view? What is necessary to implement this kind of pan-European thinking? That at the end, we don't ask ourselves what is good for Germany or for France, but what is good for Europe? And you're asking yeah. me. <laughs> <laughs> because I know you, have, you know the answer. So. Well, Point number one, I think that the, the euro, certainly in, in, in the group of countries that have agreed to be bound by this common currency, I think the euro has done a lot to unify people and to make all of us traveling from one country to the other understand that this is really one single economic unit uh, with not necessarily the same fiscal policies, uh, fiscal in the terms of tax policies, uh, but certainly with the same investment rules, with the same monetary policy. Uh, whether we like it or, or not, and whether we completely agree or slightly disagree on the actual role of the, uh, of the ECB when it comes to monetary policy. But I think to have that common uh, financial uh, link between us uh, has, been, has been extremely strong. Um, you're asking me what more we should be doing. I think that on the Erasmus front, we have done a lot, but we should be doing a lot more. Um, under the Erasmus program, uh, students from one country can go and spend at least one year uh, in another uh, member state and, and study and acquire sufficient credits so that that year abroad can qualify for purposes of their own 
uh, educational process at home. We should have many more. I don't think it's a massive investment. And, and uh, if we want to push the Lisbon agenda, I think that's certainly one of the tools that we should be using. So the er push the Erasmus program. I think Vivian Reading, if she was around in her previous capacity at least, uh, would, would, could not uh, disagree with that and would, would be on the same page. Uh, I think there is one, one domain uh, where we should clearly uh, try to move at the same speed, at the same pace, on the same path, and that is research and development. I know I'm, I'm sort of hang on to that research and development, but I think that that's where our future lies. Uh, that's where we can join forces, uh, not only compare notes and share experience, because we're doing that uh, between the clusters, between the competitiveness um, uh, grouping or the district, te the technological district, the, te the district or technological in Italy, you know, those are the, the ones that I'm thinking of which are already coexisting and, and comparing notes. I think we should be able to share budgets and, and, and joint venture a lot more in specific areas where we believe that Europe has a competitive advantage uh, relative to the other. I could not disagree and I actually strongly agree with what you were saying about uh, green Europe and what proposals we should, be, we should be making. I think we should do a lot in terms of co-development uh, with other countries, particularly around the uh, Mediterranean um, Sea um, coast line and, and form that European Union which uh, has been advocating by, by my president. I mean, those, those are uh, clear. I mean, the, the Eurozone the Erasmus research and development uh, investment and all of that with a view to reaching at least a portion of those Lisbon agenda goals uh, where we are a little bit short of uh, completion now. Very good. Mr. Patrick, famous question from, I think, Henry Kissinger, which is the telephone number of Europe. And if you ask people in, in, the, in Europe, how about uh, the efficiency of uh, the parliament and, and uh, the commissioners in, in Brussels. I think people have still different views on that. What in your view is necessary to change or improve, uh, modernize the institutional framework of the EU to make it even more efficient going forward and to play the role all our panelists would like to see actually for Europe? Thank you very much, Josef Ackermann. And we are in Switzerland, as everybody knows, and things are very complex here, and you have your cantone and your, even your referenda. And in the European Union, we are living now with almost 500 million people in 27 countries, and we have hundreds of regions, thousands of cities and counties, and Europe is very complex. And so what we have to achieve is to unite Europe, to have the unity of Europe, and at the same time to defend our cultural richness, our variety. And this always is, not always, but very often is in a conflict. And then we have to find the right balance. In principle, I am in favor of a free internal market. That means an exchange of people, uh, of goods, services, and capital. But there are buts, B-U-T. And if there, for instance, are cultural values in a region, in a county, we have to defend them in a Europe, because otherwise we lose the support of the people. And the identity of Europe needs at the same time that we accept the identity of the nations, of the regions, and of the local level. And we have to work on all these levels. And the European Parliament has developed in a way which is really enormous. I was asked, if you allow me to say this, in 1979, in 84, in 89, in 94, why do we elect you? You have nothing to say. And this has changed. And Christine Lagarde spoke about Erasmus. And I don't want now a dispute between the European Parliament and our governments. But when the governments took a decision in December 2005 about the budget 2007-2013, they reduced the money for Erasmus and the youth program. And it was a European Parliament that we increased it, and so we cooperate, and so we increase uh, the democracy in the European Parliament. And with this reform treaty, which we really need, we have a strong basis for the European Union, and that's why uh, I appreciate very much how the French government, the French parliament, and the Dutch uh, government, and the Dutch uh, 
Parliament how they deal with the question to find a solution after the no in France and, uh, and in the Netherlands. And I was not politically very much a friend of uh, President. Uh, I was a young person, so I could not have friendly relations with President Charles de Gaulle. But he once said, in a referendum, people vote everything, but not the question which is asked. I would not go so far, but this is, there is some truth in it. Yeah. And this uh, plombier polonais, the Polish plumber, was a great dispute in France, although, although the French need the Polish plumber. I could give you an example. You would laugh a lot, but uh, the time does not allow it to give <laughs> the example which I normally give in my speeches. <laughs> Thank you. Maybe, maybe as you do it, Prime Minister, sir. We have now someone in, in Brussels being in charge of reducing red tape. Uh, what is your experience with Brussels from a country point of view? And second question, uh, maybe adding to that, how could Europe play a bigger role from an institutional point of view in the, on a global scale? In, in the, let's say in, in resolving crises in the world, in, in talking and integrating Russia or, or, or other big nations into the European uh, context. Mr. Balkan. Yeah. First, uh, what are your experiences with Brussels? Well, uh, normally we have very good relations. Sometimes there are some difficulties, but we've always said, uh, we, by example, let, let's start with the uh, European Commission. We always supported the work of the European Commission. And uh, that has been uh, the case in the past and I'm uh, working very closely together with uh, Jean and, uh, Jose Manuel Barroso. And I think the Commission is playing a very good role. Then, working with the European Parliament. For me, when I had the presidency of the European Council, it was in 2004, I enjoyed the meetings of the European Parliament, but because it is good to have the debate, vice versa, it's, it was essential. And uh, also when we talk now about the difficulties in a time of reflection, I think it has been very good that we had these meetings, that we tried to, to find the solution together. And the cooperation with the European Council, I think it's very productive. So by and large, I'm enthusiastic about working together. And I say that as a, a representative of a country that is, was one of the founding members of the European Union. I've always uh, said our future is in Europe, and therefore you need the institutions. And I agree what has been said about the reform treaty, we need the ratification now. We must end the discussion about institutions because it has to do with content. And that is uh, linked to your second uh, question. Yesterday evening there was a very inspiring working dinner also about Europe. And on my table we had a discussion, what is Europe really about? Because we are talking about markets and money, free flow of uh, capital, goods, services, persons. But then we said, what is the identity, the characteristic of Europe? And we were thinking and talking about it, and the common conclusion at my table was the central element of European history and cooperation is social responsibility. And therefore you can declare why we have had and why, why we have welfare states in Europe, why we have the solidarity within the European Union. They, therefore you can explain why we want to contribute to the realization of the Millennium Development Goals, why uh, we are active in the field of um, climate change. And it is my conviction, and uh, Anders, you made important remarks, and I fully agree with that. As I said, Europe can make a difference, but then, of course, we have to speak with one voice, we need common strategies, and we need a very clear agenda. And what I noticed uh, since the time when I'm Prime Minister, and I'm Prime Minister in 2002, I see the progress. By example, the discussion about innovation in Europe. First, there was general discussion about the Lisbon agenda. And halfway we said, we need more focus. And now you can see the improvements, thanks to the reports of the European Commission, but also the fact that we say we should focus more on growth and jobs. That's one. Uh, Tony Blair and I wrote a letter to our colleagues that said we have to put the uh, issue of the um, climate change on the agenda, and we have to be practical. And, yet, and last year, it was the year of, uh, of words, but now on these. And Europe took a position in Bali. And Anders is busy with the preparations of the, the very important uh, conference next year in, in Denmark. So after the time of reflection, after the institutional discussions, we should talk about content. And I think, and that's the, I think the different uh, phase now, um, there is really a reason and a ground 
to work together. And I'm enthusiastic about it. But you have to be clear in your goals and you need clear timetables and clear implementation strategies. And sometimes that will be difficult, but we need it. And uh, looking at the uh, economic framework, we have the euro, we have the European Central Bank, we have the criteria of the stability and growth pact, we have the Lisbon agenda. And these were, I think, very important results of a good cooperation. So I think we have to work on that, but we have to be very clear with clearly defined goals, clear timetables, and then we can manage it. And that's not only responsibility for ourselves here in Europe, but also worldwide. Okay. So, <clears throat> Mr. Ackerman, you started out by talking about uh, national treasures. Um, and that's a fact, I think, and I think we sh that's our point of departure. We do have national treasures, and I think we should take advantage of the diversity and seek strength through diversity uh, in, in Europe. And we should um, realize that the European <coughs> Union is neither uh, a federal state nor a non-committal -com debating society. It's something in between. I think it's uh, former uh, Commission President Delors who described it as an UPO, UPO an unidentified political object. And that's exactly what it is. Uh, uh, world history has never seen anything like the European Union. Uh, but it is, the European Union is well suited to solve the challenges of Europe, I think, because the base is national member states. And we, that's our point of departure. But in common, we have handed over sovereignty to a supranational body in areas where it's obvious that we can much better find solution in common than separately. Seen from that point of view, our cooperation with the Brussels uh, is excellent. Uh, we attach strong importance to having uh, a strong uh, EU Commission. Uh, we consider the EU Commission a guarantor uh, of community interests. And uh, in cooperation with the European Parliament, uh, we think uh, it constitutes a good balance together with uh, the European Council, which is um, uh, the forum for uh, individual uh, member states. So I think we have this tripartition of powers. Uh, the EU Commission, the Parliament, uh, the European Council, and in my opinion, it works uh, efficiently. Um, I fully agree with Minister Lagarde uh, uh, concerning uh, research and development. We have worked hard to increase budget, and I appreciate very much the support of the European Parliament in that uh, respect. We succeeded in increasing funds for that uh, in, in last uh, budget. Um, I think we should uh, expand our internal market and include what I will call free movement of knowledge, uh, a European research area, because that's a very efficient means to uh, strengthen integration, a free, uh, so, uh, uh, more exchange of students, teachers, researchers, um, free flow of information, ideas, research results. I think at the European level we could add value uh, if we strengthen our efforts uh, in, in that respect. But I would also mention another area in which I think we should stick to national responsibility, and that's social security. I think social security uh, is a national uh, responsibility because we have national diversities which should be taken uh, into consideration. Uh, Minister Lagarde uh, mentioned the flex security model. We are proud of this. We think it, it, it works efficiently, but obviously it cannot just be uh, copied in other countries. You have to take into consideration national uh, Diversity, for instance, in France, I think 8% of the workers are organized in labor unions. In Denmark, it's 80%. And obviously, it makes a difference. In Denmark, we can base uh, social security on collective uh, agreements in the labor market because uh, our labor market is, uh, market is well organized. While in France, it's a bit more difficult. 
Uh, I would commend you for your endeavors uh, to include social partners uh, in the reform process, and I'm happy to see that so far it, uh, you have succeeded uh, in doing that. So we can learn from best practice in other countries, but I think we should stick to national responsibility and respect national diversity. And in conclusion, I think we're going to have a telephone number now for Kissinger and others. Um, uh, if, uh, we, uh, in, the new, uh, in the new treaty, we create a new service. Uh, we strengthen the role of the High Representative, and to his disposal will be an, a new external action service, a sort of common foreign uh, service, uh, which can, um, uh, which can um, strengthen our capability to formulate and pursue a common approach at the international uh, scene. So I think we are moving gradually in the right direction. Thank you. I think it's a very important development. Ali Babachan, you said in a speech about four or five years ago, it's not that important when you join the EU. It's important that we continue the accession process. It's important for domestic reasons, but probably also from an integration point of view. Do you think that uh, in the last few years, with all the discussions we had in Europe about uh, Turkish membership, that uh, this uh, pressure somewhat has been reduced? Would, would you like to, to activate it again in, in a more um, active way? Well, after, after we started the accession process at the end of 2004, we started to have some political difficulties vis-a-vis -vis our EU process. The first uh, event was probably the German elections, and Turkey was one of the main teams of the election campaign. Then after the elections in Germany, okay, we had a new government, and the new government uh, is fulfilling the pledges which has been already made. Then we had the election process in France, and then the new government of France is openly telling that it is not a good idea to have Turkey as a full member, but have a kind of different relationship at the end of the road. And then we had the Cyprus issue, which had another political impact on our Turkey-EU relations. When we realized that our progress, formal progress, chapter by chapter, so to say, is not going to be dependent too much on our technical or legal progress, but it will be influenced a lot by the overall political situation in the EU, we decided to put a distance between our formal negotiations process and our actual reform process in Turkey. And at the beginning of 2007, we announced a new strategy. We said that we are no longer waiting for the formal opening ceremonies of chapters, but we are going ahead with our own reform program. Because after we did all the screening process and after we have learned every single detail of the EU acquis through our uh, meetings with the EU Commission, whether they are in Ankara or in Brussels, I have involved thousands and thousands of people, 140 NGOs, and every single government institution is in the process. Then we said we have learned all the secrets. We really don't need to wait formal opening ceremonies, which takes only 15 minutes to continue our reforms. And we have announced this 400-page document in April last year, which includes 200 laws, 600 secondary legislations, which will take us until 2013 to complete. And that, that program is already in implementation. So whether a chapter is formally opened or not, we are continuing with our reform process. And this is quite a unique approach compared to the other new member states, I should say, because Turkish process is unique, is a unique process. And the political climate in the EU will probably have seasonalities. Sometimes EU will be more, will have a more visionary approach, sometimes more inclusive, sometimes maybe more inward looking. Sometimes there will be trends of nationalism protectionism, sometimes EU will be more uh, self-confident. So we did not want our reform efforts to be influenced by, so to say, the moods in the overall EU, all in some specific member states, but just to go ahead with what we have to do anyway for our own purposes. And at the end of the road, of course, there will be a big discussion. An EU with Turkey or an EU without Turkey? Because we know that we have to have the uh, improve, uh, we have to have the, the, the uh, approval of every single member state to become a member at the end of the road. We are aware of it. 
But at the end of the road, it is going to be a different Turkey. Looking at how much we have done, how much we have changed during the last five years, it is not very difficult to imagine or project what kind of a country we will see in five, seven, ten years' time. And then probably it will be an easier decision on the EU side also. And then it, at that point, I don't know if Turkey will still be willing to be in all the uh, complex structures and the Brussels and so forth. Maybe uh, we will want to be independent in some areas, or who knows, maybe we will some, still find some value at the end of the road. But the important thing is keeping the target over there as a firm target, as a full membership target, and moving towards that target for short to medium term is the best strategy for Turkey and for the European Union as well. Because sometimes we see some trends in some countries and we really question, do we really want to be like them or not? Because Turkey is becoming a, such an open country, such an open society that and our uh, trade volume just exports increased from 36 billion to 106 billion in five years. Uh, and, and per capita GMP tripled during the, in terms of dollars or euros, tripled during the last five, six years. And uh, our such a fast uh, growth pace, it also comes from the liberties that we have in terms of our economic policies and, and uh, trade policies and so forth. So uh, we just hope that the EU stays uh, to be an open entity. The EU, but at the end of our road, stays to be an entity which uh, is, is really solving uh, its problems and look, looking ahead. So uh, I think it's too early to discuss that right now. And that's what we are talking with our German colleagues, with our French colleagues, that why is, are you making this a really big discussion now? Because this is going to be discussed anyway at the end of the road. But of course, every uh, country has its own domestic politics. And uh, as some experienced politicians say, which I'm not, uh, politics, all politics are local. So maybe that's the maybe that's the uh, that's the that's the maybe the, the, the answer. But uh, we have a very strong political will, and despite the difficulties, strong public support to continue the process and uh, and and contribute contribute to the EU. Even. Thank you very much. Let me now open the question uh, the, the floor to a few questions from the audience. Yes, please. Uh, hello, I'm Nicolas DeSantis. I run a think tank about um, doing research also about European identity. And um, uh, I'd be very interesting to, to hear. We have a, obviously a very a huge divide between European politicians and the citizens understanding the project of Europe. They might know their his, the history, but uh, how do you see, and I'd like to open to the panel, and then understand how Turkey sees that identity affecting uh, once they come in, because I think they will. In terms of um, how do we explain such a complex concept? Uh, and although we all have euros in our pockets, uh, the meaning of that euro, where it comes from, it's very difficult to, to transcend, to try and have a sense of pride about that currency in our pockets. And I'd like to know and hear what, what you have to say about European identity becoming more uh, easier to understand. Let me put it this way, a brand about Europe. Maybe we ask the President of the European Parliament, what is, what is the brand? What is the, how would you market Europe in Hong Kong? Thank you very much for uh, giving me the floor and uh, thank you for the question. I don't want to repeat what I said answering the first question which I was asked by the Chairman. I think the basic points are our values and principles. But what we need, and I thank you very much that you spoke about the euro. The euro and the president of a very important bank might not like to hear it, but I think he might even uh, agree. The euro is much more than just an economic or financial instrument. The euro is an expression that we as Europeans go into the future together with one single currency. And this means being together, means peace, common values, and so on and so on. And I regret very much that it was necessary, unfortunately, or apparently necessary, to take the symbols out of the reform treaty. 
I'm not criticizing Jan Peter Balkenende, whom I like very much with his policy, how he helped to overcome this problem. But taking out the symbols, the hymn and the flag should never mean that we give these symbols up. And I appreciate that the new president of France had not only the tricolore but the European flag on his uh, official photo as well. And you know what I suggested for the European Parliament when all this happened to take the symbols out? I said, let us expect when we have visitors, presidents of countries, let's have them when they come to our red carpet in Strasbourg, let's play the European anthem and the national one. And so we did it at the entrance of the European Parliament with the President of Portugal and then with the President uh, of uh, France. And then there were some colleagues, they said, oh, this is a beautiful idea, let's play it even in the hemicycle. And then I said, no, let's not provoke others now. The priority of the priority is now to get the reform treaty. And this, might, this timing might be an example that we in Europe must go step by step to achieve our goals. And I ask everybody not to make proposals now, maybe European taxes or whatsoever, to, uh, to, to create a situation that in the end the reform treaty fails. So we must be very patient, we must be very prudent, but I agree totally we need our symbols because they are the expression of our European identity. Yeah, to prevent any misunderstanding, I am pro the symbols. I am enthusiastic about the flag and the anthem. No misunderstanding. The only question is, should it got a place in the Constitution or not? That was the point. And I am very happy that you have given me the opportunity to clarify the position. I think we need symbols. That has to do exactly what you are asking about identity. And um, referring back to your question, uh, the famous American sociologist Amatai Azioni, he's always talking about diversity and unity. And the nice thing of Europe is that we have diverse societies, different languages, cultures, histories, and so on. But still, we're working together. We have one continent. And then is the question, what is our unity? What's the unity? What do we have in common? Why are we Europeans? And how can you define that? And if you talk about issues like the values that has to do with human rights, with democracy, I think that's a characteristic for the, 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 the European society. And that's the reason why we had a discussion yesterday where we, where we talked about solidarity, social responsibility, and so on. I think that is a feature why we work together. And it is true what you say. We have to talk more, I think, about values in Europe. Because usually we talk about the practical aspects. We talk about the, 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 our currency and economic issues. And they are important. But also we need that moral reflection. And when we had our presidency, we organized conference about that question. What do we have in common? Europe, a beautiful idea. Values in Europe. And uh, Hans Gert made it very clear, I think, that's also another dimension. Because you need the reflection of values to know what do we have in common. Um, well, though symbols might be important, I don't think European identity is about symbols. It's first and foremost about basic values and uh, principles. Uh, on the other hand, it's a bit difficult to, to speak about these European values and principles as European because, in my opinion, they are to a great extent universal. But I would nevertheless point to three of them. Firstly, respect for the individual. Uh, though we are in favor of strong communities, we always, first and foremost, respect the right of the <coughs> individual. That's one, for me, one basic European value, but I'd also consider it a universal value. Secondly, and in connection with that, gender equality. I consider that one of our basic uh, values. And thirdly, um, which is a heritage from the European age of enlightenment, a wide-ranging uh, freedom of expression. Um, and in Europe we distinguish, distinguish clearly uh, between religion and politics. I consider uh, these uh, principles and values very important 
in describing a European identity while accepting uh, that they might be values and principles uh, for other countries and regions in the world as well. And basically, I consider them uh, universal values. Thank you. Another question? Yes, please. Yeah. Anta Mutambara from Zimbabwe. In, in order to understand the purpose of Europe, uh, there are three areas that are not very clear in my mind. The European views on global terrorism. Some of us from the emerging markets believe that there are genuine economic, political, and social grievances that terrorists take advantage of. And unless and until something is done to resolve those grievances, we can't succeed in the war on terror. What is European critique of the American war on terror? Nuclear weapons. What is the rationale behind ownership of nuclear weapons? Why is it okay for France and Britain to have nuclear weapons and not Denmark, South Africa, or Iran for that matter? In any case, is it sustainable to have this non-proliferation uh, treaty and activity? Don't you think the future belongs to a world where there's no need for nuclear weapons? The Security Council. What kind of reforms does the European Union want to see in the Security Council? Why does it make sense for Britain and France to have seats in the Security Council when China and India, South Africa have no... What kind of reforms would Europe want to see in the Security Council? Thank you very much. Thank you. I think many, many questions. Uh, could we maybe more the channel response and how do we see foreign policy issues from a European point of view? I don't know. Who would like to, to start? Is it Patrick? If you like, uh, but I didn't want to ask for the floor because you gave me the chance in the last round. First, terrorism. We have to fight terrorism with all our strength, but on a basis of our legal order. This is the framework. Secondly, nuclear weapons. We have already too many in the world, and we should try not to expand nuclear weapons. And thirdly, the uh, reform of the Security Council I would like to see a reform of the Security Council which allows in a medium-term perspective that the European Union is part of it. Any? Well, let, yeah. me, let, me make, uh, let me make a remark about the war uh, circle against terrorism. I think there's really worldwide a common interest to fight against it because it uh, creates terrible situations and we need something else. What are the challenges today? We talk about climate change, we talk about solidarity, we talk about Millennium Development Goals, and I think we should focus on these issues. And if you have this uh, tendency of terrorism, we have to do utmost, our utmost to prevent, and therefore we have to work together, and that's a common challenge and a common responsibility. Therefore, and I think also in order to prevent clash between civilization and so on, we need a very strong action and a very strong voice against it. And I'm very worried about it because the, there are so many positive developments that we need now. And if you have a world with a terrorism, uh, I think we are paying our attention on uh, very negative developments and we should do our utmost to prevent that. And I think also the European Union uh, has a, to play, a role to play, but you cannot do it alone, you need each other. And we have to be very strict and, um, and I think that's our common responsibility. And uh, the other remarks I can refer to what Hans Getzer. Thank you. Maybe one more last question. Yes, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, Valdis Dombrovskis, MEP from Latvia. Uh, well, my question would be mostly directed uh, to Prime Minister Balkanenda, but I think it's also uh, relevant to other uh, panelists. EU budget was already uh, mentioned in uh, this discussion, and uh, if we remember the previous discussion on financial perspectives 2007-2013, uh, we also remember the famous letter of six uh, stating that the EU budget shouldn't exceed 1% of EU GNI, no matter, no matter what, what, and let the European Commission do the costs, uh, do the cuts. And the heading which suffered mostly uh, from this letter of six was also, the heading mostly related to Lisbon Treaty, uh, to Lisbon uh, Agenda, something also mentioned here. Uh, so, 
uh, given that uh, this discussion started five years ago, uh, five years ahead of the uh, beginning of financial perspectives for 2002, it means that soon, probably early next year, we'll start the discussions on uh, uh, financial perspectives 2014-2021. So the question is, what kind of approach we can expect to these financial perspectives? Do we expect another letter of six stating you budget no more than that and that's the main priority? Or do we expect some other approach to EU budget? Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's a very interesting question. Do I have half an hour? <laughs> um, you're right, it's always uh, complicated to talk about uh, this issue because there are different interests. And I must say we found a solution for the financial perspectives and indeed we had also a discussion with the European Parliament, we found a solution. And uh, you're right, uh, the preparations will be there for the next round. And we also will have a midterm review. And there are some uh, essential questions uh, to be answered. Uh, and that's the reason why I mentioned the midterm review. We will talk about the future of, and as the Minister already said, European agriculture policy and the financial aspects of it, the reforms that are already occurring, the role of uh, Europe as far as uh, innovation is concerned. And then the question is, uh, should it be financed on an international basis, on an EU basis, or are there other forms, coordination, cooperation between countries, uh, defining the same criteria? And we have to talk about all these issues, and that's the reason why it's good to have such a midterm review and uh, timely begin to think about it. And the challenges in uh, Europe, I think, that has to do with issues like innovation. We have to strengthen it, otherwise we can forget our competitive strength in the, in the future. And then it's also good to have, have a clear link between innovation and other important issues like climate change. And all these issues we have to define, and that can be very relevant for the next round of the financial perspectives. And therefore, it's good to have a timely discussion about it, and I'm sure it will be a complicated one. But it starts with uh, having a clear view on Europe's responsibility. And then I think it must be possible to find the right answers. Thank you. Uh, probably you know the story that an economist was asked about the economic situation and he could answer in one word and he said it's good and then in two words no good. So I, I did ask uh, Chairman Greenspan two years ago uh, to answer that question in two words about the euro and his answer was and we all know he was a very euro skeptic his answer was surprisingly good. So <laughs> if, he, if he now in the final round asked the question in two words what do you think the world will say about Europe in 2015? Christine. Um, amazingly creative, but if you give me two seconds in addition to two words, I'd like to know how many of you in the audience are Europeans? Raise your hands. Massive number. Can I just suggest that we are all European ambassadors? You asked how we can promote Europe in Hong Kong. I think it's an individual responsibility of each and every member of Europe to be ambassador, not only of our own country, but also of Europe. And I hope that we can promote that brand identity that you beautifully portrayed as being based on values and principles, solidarity, human rights, and democracy. I think that's, that would be a real message from Davos to the world. Mr. Petring. Europe has learned its lessons from the history. Europe plays an important role in the world because it is united. Thank you. Mr. Balkanini. I found two words. Huh? Uh, solidarity, sustainability, and I need three, economic dynamism, if you allow. And about the question you, you mentioned, uh, Henry Kissinger. And that was the famous uh, question that has been discussed here. I'll remember also another um, uh, question that was journalist, and he asked, she asked, uh, Mr. Kissinger, is it true that uh, asking you a question costs three hundred dollars? And his answer was yes. Next question. Ali <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, assuming that the national governments and Brussels will keep doing the right things. In two words, Europe could be surprisingly good. Thank you. Rasmussen. Mr. Rasmussen. Two words, I would say, admirable, strong. Uh, and uh, I base this optimism uh, on the new 
sentiments uh, we feel uh, right now. I, I feel a stronger self-confidence uh, in, in Europe. Uh, the treaty process has come to an end, and now we can change from being a bit inward-looking to becoming more outward-looking. Thank you. Let's not forget this uh, euphoria which we have heard, and I think it's really reality right now. Let's thank our panelists for their contribution with a big hand.